the, uh, the, the notion around what we do overall, just to remember this, flexibility at speed, okay? That is the thing that we're doing that really separates us from the pack. But conceptually, at the very highest level, we're providing supply chains with a complete automated materials handling system for high, high mix, high volume applications. So what's that mean for you? It means that we're looking at where you've got maybe part changeover, where you're historically, if you were going to do it uh, in a mechanical way, you would have a lot of process change. It would probably handle a lot of changes in fixturing. So as a result, you put a person on. Yeah. If you are handling consumer goods that are finished, if you've got high skew variability, our systems allow for that to be uh, to deal with that variability. And the way we do it is we're integrating artificial intelligence with vision grasping and motion control. And this is this is really different when you think about bringing all those together, it gives the machine human-like flexibility because as humans, we have vision, we grasp, and we have motion control. This is really a paradigm shift in the way we think about uh, application. So as a practical matter, what does that mean? When you look at um, robot control, historically, robots programmed offline on a teach pendant, you put all the waypoints in it, and the thing's going to run, and you turn it on, and it just does that job over and over and over. It's beautiful. It's essentially offline, pre-programmed for an activity when the line goes live. What happens when you use uh, vision and motion control with our artificial intelligence, you're updating that path plan you just did offline in real time, and it's, it's pretty cool. So what that does is it gives you this flexibility like humans. So the core of us, so we do system integration work, so we can cover a whole soup to nuts and give you complete turnkey solutions. We have that bandwidth in the organization is this software product. So the artificial intelligence uh, portion of it's called Neocortex, and we're using um, various kinds of uh, artificial intelligence techniques. People have a tendency to kind of lay a monolith over AI and say, oh, it's all AI. Well, what AI, what is AI? AI is a bunch of discrete tools that are developed over the last 50 years, and we can use a whole host of them, including what's sort of the latest tool that's very useful is called deep learning. So, Significantly, what it does is it allows the system to recognize things that are not possible with vision by itself. Well, okay, so how does it do that? It does it just the way we do it in so much as we take inference from um, a similarity in objects to make a decision about what it is that's in front of us and what we're going to do with it. Coffee cup's a good example. You can know there's infinite kinds of coffee cups, but they all have similar characteristics. A round vessel that we know holds a liquid, holds hot liquid, has a handle on it. That's a coffee cup. Well, okay, the artificial intelligence can go, it's got a handle, it's got a vessel, it's about yay size, that's probably a coffee cup, okay? Those are the kinds of things that then give it the expansive ability to handle a wide range of objects because it's doing this categorization. We do uh, real-time robot path planning, which I'll show you some videos in a minute. Completely amazing how that works. Uh, the identification of a wide variety of objects and real-time grasp analysis is uh, state-of-the-art. And that is a process whereby you begin to use the data of how a thing has been uh, uh, gathered to drive inference about what it is you're actually doing. This is, this is absolutely cutting-edge stuff that's happening here, and it's incremental the way it's uh, implemented. So is it necessary all the time? Absolutely not. Is it valuable in some cases? Yes. So the neocortex is sold um, Depending on your application, can be cell, can be resident to the uh, um, uh, actual physical work cell. It can sit in a, a server room in the factory. It, can, it has a cloud connection as well. So that's why we need this internet connection. Spatial vision is the platform that lays underneath it. This is the thing we started building back when we started the company. And what that is uh, is a, a, a system that has. Drawdown screens that allow you to pick various sensors, robots, and so on, and we configure this to accommodate all of the elements that are being pulled in. So it, 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 it communicates with the sensors of various ilks, it communicates with the robots, communicates with PLC, whatever is required for the system that becomes the hub, central hub. Neocortex is an overlay that sits on top of it. Sometimes all you need is spatial vision. Sometimes you don't need the horsepower of neocortex. That's done when you've got a few parts. If you have 10 or 12 parts, they never change. I probably don't need to sell you neocortex, right? We can do it with spatial vision because there's an upcharge for this. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so if you don't get neocortex, what kind of objects can you handle just with spatial vision? It's going to be, it's going to be uh, objects that don't have variability. So um, 
Say, for example, we're doing a job right now where we're handling uh, strawberry plants. Well, how organic can you get, right? That has, to have that has to have neocortex because of the complexity of from object to object changing. So if you have organic things that change, there's a high probability you're going to need neocortex. Let's say you make hamburger buns. Uh, probably you're going to need neocortex, right, because there's just some variability in it. If you're, say, a, a company that's doing machining, and your business is to build, uh, you know, five kinds of widgets, and that's your entire process, you don't need neocortex. Because one thing, we're going to know exactly what that object is. We're going to be able to load in CAD models and handle that in some ways that doesn't require the artificial intelligence. Okay? that answer your question? Mm hmm Okay. Uh, we won't work with any robot, right? We'll work with any sensor, we work with any robot. It just depends on what your, uh, what your uh, requirements are. What that does is it allows us to take full advantage of the fact that as software people, first and foremost, we're listening to what your need is, and then we're backing into the solution, as opposed to me coming at you with a machine that goes, well, if you change your problem, I can actually solve your problem with my piece of equipment. It's a little different from that. We're really quite proud about this. So the flexibility at speed, but it's reliable flexibility at speed. Um, we had, and, and you've witnessed, you've lived this firsthand, <laughs> but uh, we had to build up reliability. When we came out of the gate, we were like, hey, we're 95% there. Well, that's not good enough for supply chain. So we spent, and this was back in 10. So we spent a few years really pushing up our reliability metrics. Okay, so we're very proud of that. You can see that reliability is now up where it needs to be to be a solution. Well, what does reliability mean in this kind of application? It means how often does a human have to intervene? This is not mean time between failure. Software doesn't have that as a metric. What it means is, does a human have to step in and give the robot assistant? You, you tend to that, and you build up that reliability by doing a couple of things. One, as I point up down here, we analyze the probability of what the decision we're about to make. We're going to pick this up and move it over here. We're going to look at it several different ways, with several different variations of an algorithm. We're going to run the probabilities of what we're about to do is the right thing, and then we're going to execute it. What's really cool is we're doing that as fast as 500 milliseconds, which means I can make that, I can analyze it, drive the decision, make and tell the robot where it is, where it's going, in, in very, very fast time. So I'm operating underneath robot speed, which is why we're getting faster than humans. Uh, accuracy is a function of the sensor, right? So, you know, if you don't need a super highly accurate, you know, $50,000 sensor, we're not going to tell you you need to buy one. And that's going to allow you to get to a metric that makes, uh, makes sense on the delivery. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So uh, a little history about the company. Yeah, we've been at this for a while. Uh, back in 2001 uh, was when the uh, sensor motor coupled AI was invented uh, at NASA. Um, uh, that was then proven and we did a, a fundraise, uh, closed in 2008 and launched the company. Uh, within the first year, we were actually the first to sh demonstrate uh, uh, reactive control of an industrial robot, though that had been done academically before. It had never been done on an industrial robot. So we tapped into the controller and had it follow a little pink poster around with its arm. It was really pretty cool. 2010, uh, the software platform Spatial Vision uh, was built uh, and introduced. Neocortex was uh, brought out uh, into the marketplace at the same time. We had our first sale to uh, General Motors. And we won a uh, NVIDIA uh, One to Watch Award because we used that parallel processing underneath the hood of our processors. In uh, 2012, we achieved uh, random box moving. We kind of got that problem solved. And we reduced our processing speed over those intervening years because we recognized that being able to move fast was going to be important for us. So we got the, the um, uh, processing speeds down. By 2014, in this window of building up reliability, we got those reliability metrics up to where they worked. 2015, we closed our first million dollar contract. Pretty cool. Uh, we also then uh, started, uh, introduced uh, uh, unlimited uh, skew random picking up to 27 picks a minute, and I'll show you a video of that here in a minute. And then uh, last year, we introduced the Goods to Robot system and a um, cloud-based version of the uh, software subscription. And a uh, uh, fun fact, uh, given all the jobs that we've done, we've handled billions of objects. So we've been at this for a while. And it's an interesting point because if you go out in the marketplace right now, you're going to see two or three other startups that are saying exactly the same thing we are. But I can tell you, from here to here, this is the pain they haven't had yet. And they're going to have to go through that. So if they're a two-year-old company and they're down here and you do business with them, 
you're going to have you're going to be party to this like you know our early adopters were, and that's not a risk you should be taking. Right? What you're seeing here in the video is a demonstration of uh, uh, random bin picking that is uh, at 900 picks an hour, which you know we are typically saying we're going to uh, deliver 700. Six, seven hundred, right? Ten to twelve picks, uh, picks a minute. In this particular example, we're running at those speeds, and that just naturally happened, even given the the cycle uh, distance. Because the, the the way we're going to analyze your application is, what is it we have to pick? How hard is it for us to get a hold of it? Because that costs time in the cycle. How far are we moving it? And then what are we doing with it when we put it down? Does it require reorientation? If we have to do that. We have to hit an intermediate fixture. That's going to slow down cycle time. So in a case like that, then it becomes, the economics become, well, if we have to service a supply chain that's, that has a specific kind of application, and I can tell you that we're not going to hit your throughput rates, you're going to have to then analyze whether you need two of these systems to achieve the result, and that's what we look for, okay? But uh, fun, fun uh, quote there, your bin picking is the best we've seen by far, you're beating everyone. So that was from a major executive who spent a lot of time looking at these things, so that's where we are. So I want to reinforce this point that we're hardware independent, okay? We'll run any actuated machine, gripper, sensor from all manufacturers, and we've been doing it that way since the beginning. That was uh, when we launched the company, that was uh, one of the uh, hallmarks of our business model, was we weren't just going to tie ourselves to one particular machine or another. So all major robot manufacturers, industrial or collaborative, depending on what you need, tool manufacturers, we also do our own tool design when that's uh, practical and this is the way to go after a solution. Sensors, it's whatever you need. These are obviously brand names at the top, and structured light, 2D, laser, time of flight, stereopsis, x-ray, infrared, LIDAR, I don't care, right? And we just tie into it. And then controls, obviously Rockwell and Siemens are the two majors. Crisp plant is used in, in some facilities, uh, lots of soft goods, and then we've also encountered customers where their IT departments have created their own system, and we can tie into that too. Because really it comes down to what are the basic methodologies for message passing? And we're just going to say, what's the information you want? What's the information I can give? And we just sit down and work that out. It's, it's really straightforward. So what it means for you as a customer, best sensor robot tool configuration solves your problem. And we're always looking at what's the most efficient way to do this from a cost perspective and time to market. Um, improved subsystems can be upgraded. So let's say we've given you a sensor because of your application only requires 10 millimeters of accuracy. But we know that if we gave you five millimeters of accuracy, uh, we could do something, maybe pick up a smaller box, for example. Well, okay, the sensor companies are constantly pushing the technology, which for the sensor companies, it's about higher resolution, faster processing, right? Faster image capture. As those upgrade, we, they can be folded in. We may call you in a couple of years ago, hey, you know, you're using this sensor, but there's actually a new sensor. We'll come in and put it in here, you know, quote it as an upgrade, and uh, we can upgrade your system, and now it's more capable because we're building on all these other elements of the platform. Okay? So, um, just to reinforce it, right, can be specialized to your specific task for handling without a lot of work. So, let's take a look at some videos here. So, um, this is just, uh, you know, finished goods handling. It's just showing you a whole range of things that can be picked. So as it kind of moves through it, that's cool, picking up a clear bottle. I mean, come on, that's crazy. This is also really fun. Uh, here we're demonstrating dynamic obstacle avoidance. So in this case, what's happening is we're, we're reading where the position of this toad is between every take, factoring that into the positioning of the robot, and then going in and doing the pick without hitting the toad. Okay. That can be useful. It's unusual. You, typically, we would propose that you control the tote, but we just wanted to make the point. This is just a, a sizzle reel of all the kinds of stuff we've worked on over the years. We've done a lot of different kinds of things, which is just sort of fun. And then over here, this shows you when you run a robot in the ideal conditions, right? We're picking one kind of object, we're using a very simple tool, and we're moving in a short distance, six, over 1,600 picks an hour. I'm not saying you can hit that with every application, but in this kind of configuration, that can be done with these robots. Well, if you're uh, uh, buying a, uh, an operation where you're saying, I want to put a human on the line here, the rule of thumb is a human does 600 picks an hour. We're blowing them out of the water. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, so bottom line, the, the lowest 
uh, setup you have, how many people can we replace in our life? We've done jobs where uh, we've put in one robot and offset five people, a shift, okay, depending on what's being done. That's, right. that's an outlier. Typically what you're going to say is it's one for one, human comes out, robot goes in, but the robot's going to work one, two, or three shifts. On a two shift use, you're going to get uh, essentially the equivalent of $7 an hour is the, the full cost with the purchase of the cell and paying for the subscription agreement. Mm -hmm. The neocortex. Okay, so where return on investment is very good with these systems, and we've spent a lot of time really focusing on that because as we came into the market in the first place, we said, okay, we're going after uh, jobs that are you know are simple to do, repetitive, and hard to find labor for because they're inherently low-paying jobs, which means you're dealing with all the factors that go with the, the semi-skilled light-duty employee. Well, for the metrics of a hardware system to actually service that. You really do want the metrics to be driven out of the software because you know the cost of these things is not that uh, great, and robots are becoming commoditized. So the prices are coming down. So when you put that all together, you really do have a fighting chance of making this a reasonable payback for you. So this is the neocortex goods to robot cell. Um, it's a complete cell, it's factory pre-built. Right? It's got the neocortex, got the robot, the tool, sensors, lighting, control, safety, and the installation. Okay, all included because we're going to put this thing up on its on its legs and it's going to be running in a day, or if there's some uh, extraneous equipment that's supporting it that we're providing, it might take a little longer. The cell by itself is that way. We have priced this aggressively, um, starting at 120,000. Which, if you hired my system integration arm to put this equipment on your floor and bolt it in as a custom job, will cost anywhere from 60 to 100 percent more. This really represents very good savings for an industrial robot. And we're doing that because it's pre-engineered, kind of like manufactured housing. You know, you're always going to get a cheaper deal on a house that comes out of a factory already pre-built. We have enough experience in the marketplace to have understood what are those variables that give you the ability to tie these elements together in a general purpose machine. The tooling might change depending on your application, but the rest of this is really designed to sit in that human footprint. You pull the human out, you forklift this in. One of the things that's actually remarkable about this, yeah, this is a 12 right. kilogram robot. Given the weight of the frame, you don't even have to bowl to the floor. Always. It's stable where it sits. So that means you can forklift in, pull it out, you can repurpose it to another location if you want to. We'll show you how to, to recalibrate and so on. This is all very easy to do. So it has lots of utility, kind of more the way you would have thought of using an employee. Now, people talk about buying collaborative robots and they look at these industrial robots, I can't tell you how many times I've had customers go, well, we're buying a collaborative robot, but I need, I need uh, you know, 12 picks a minute. I'm like, well, have you run the, the cycle analysis based on what that machine can do? And the answer almost always is no. Collaborative robot runs half the speed. Why? Newton's second law of motion. You can't move an object fast when it's around the human or you're gonna hurt them. That's just the way it is, and you can't avoid that. So, we said, okay, let's build a system that integrates as easily as a collaborative robot, but gives you all the strength and capacity of an industrial robot. So, four by four footprint, uh, 800 picks an hour, peaks to 27 uh, picks per minute, includes artificial intelligence operation all day, right? And that's us.